This is the U.S. Forest Service Fire Lab, where scientists research the elements that make up forest fires. The flames, the trees, the soil, the smoke, and the wildlife. Welcome to Wired Field Trip. This is research forester Mark Finney. He studies fire behavior. We're here in the hall of the, uh, of the fire lab experimental wing, and right behind me are the double doors which take us into the burn chamber. These scientists engineer instruments where they can recreate conditions of wildfires. This apparatus here we call Big Sandy. It's designed specifically to look at the effects of slope on the flame characteristics and on the spread of fires. And you can already see a change in the flame structure from when it was horizontal, right? These flames are deflected almost level with the platform. They're going in and then they curve up. The reason fires are spreading faster uphill than downhill is because of the fire itself. The hot flames are rising, and in order for them to rise, they're drawing air in from the sides. As we increase the angle, we're going to see the flames permanently attached to the surface, and they will not rise up off the ground. It illustrates one important principle of wildland fires, that you don't want to be uphill of a spreading fire because it can spread very, very rapidly and be very dangerous. Here is a demonstration of a surface fire through cardboard. A surface fire or a ground fire burns only what's known as forest litter. This fire is not burning the ground fuels themselves like the litter or organic material in the soil, but just on the surface. It's the movement of a fluid, in this case flame is a fluid, past an object that either heats or cools it by that contact. We burn many different configurations under different conditions to try to isolate the individual processes and study them separately. One behavior that Mark's team studies is what's known as a fire whirl. So this is a fire whirl generator. Fire whirls are an important phenomenon that occur in wildlands, and they occur naturally and they occur very, very frequently. Fire whirls are one of the most dangerous elements of a wildfire for firefighters. They have an erratic spread rate and a rapid increase in fire intensity. They create very, very strong surface winds that are much different than the ambient conditions around. A fire whirl in 1923 in Tokyo was estimated to kill 38,000 people in less than 15 minutes. The fire lab studies how they form and spread. Fires need the oxygen from wind to spread. Mark's team studies that too. Just like we study slope independently of other factors, here we need to study the effect of wind on fire spread. This is called the carousel burner because it's a burner, but it rotates and we're able to rotate the flame zone relative to the wind direction. Mark's team even converted a grain bin in order to study bigger fires. Behold, the grain bin. This is our newest experimental facility. And the purpose of this facility is to understand pretty much how large woody fuels and deep duff layers, deep organic layers burn. They usually burn in one of three ways. They either don't burn, or they burn as flaming, or they burn as smoldering. And the fact is, we have no idea what conditions determine which one of those ways that they burn. These experiments translate to predicting how fire will behave in a wildfire scenario. Right now, the current model does not account for different fuel types and other variables. But Mark's team is changing that. One thing that the early researchers here didn't understand was convection. It's very difficult to make measurements of convection in a spreading fire. So that's our main mission here, is to understand how the processes of combustion, heat transfer, and ignition all produce a spreading fire. Someday the research that we're doing here will be mature enough to be transferred into a model form, but it has to address a lot of the other behaviors. Next, we're going to talk to ecologist Sharon Hood. Her team studies forest restoration. By knowing how trees grow and how fires can scar these trees, we can see how they survive and are resilient to fire. While the Forest Service previously thought that we needed to put out all fires, there is scientific evidence America's forests are fire-dependent ecosystems. The trees survived many fires before colonialism. This sample from a ponderosa pine, where each of these years represents a fire, so 1675 is the first fire this tree survived. It killed a little bit of the cambium 
and then it, the tree survived and kept growing and it starts to curl around that scar. If we do this with dozens and dozens of samples over a whole area, we can stack those years up and compare and see how spotty a fire was, if it was patchy just in a really small area or over a large area, and how many of the trees survived. We have probably thousands of tree cores. Sharon's team drops into a forest after fires and samples them. She's going to demonstrate what coring a tree looks like. I'm trying to hit the very center of the tree. All branches point to the center of the tree, so that's a good clue. Each light and dark band together um, forms one year's worth of growth. And so these rings are really wide and evenly spaced, so that means it's growing the same amount every year. Let's follow Sharon back into the lab where they prepare samples to study the trees all the way down to the cell structure. So this is one of the fuels ovens where we can dry samples. This is a core microtome, rotary microtome. This allows us to make microscope slides to be able to look at the cellular level what's going on in the tree. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many different kinds of samples in this fire research facility. Let's take a look at the soils lab. Welcome to the soils lab. I'd like to show you our uh, soils that we experiment with. Over the years I've worked here, we've collected soil samples, large cores, 12 inches in diameter, six to eight inches deep, everywhere from Alaska to Florida. This is a demo of slash pile burning that was part of an experiment that we did to look at factors influencing heat transfer into soil. We're collecting temperature data below the soil surface. My temperature is, oh, 200, 300 degrees right now, and they're going up very quickly. So what you have is a large amount of heat being generated, but it's all going up. We estimate only up between five and 10% actually goes down into the soil. But long after the flames are gone, that's when the soils are actually being affected. As you can see from the, the data acquisition system, it's still heating up. You still have unburned fuel that's smoldering, that's glowing combustion. And if the wind picks up, it's gonna take that campfire and blow it into the, the trees next to your campsite or, or something burnable. Put your campfires out for science. So now we've looked underneath the forest, the actual trees. What about all of that smoke? The Missoula Fire Lab studies that too. Do I like the smell of campfires? Yeah, I generally like the smoky smell. That's how I make my living is smoke, so I <laughs> can't really complain. Right now we're going to demonstrate one of the methods we used to collect smoke samples, which we then bring back to the lab for chemical analysis. This is the sampling system we use for ground-based emissions for low intensity fires, where we can walk directly up to the fire and take the samples. So we open the canister. The canister is evacuated and then it starts filling with the emission sample. We try to position this, the sample probe, obviously where the emissions are coming off the fire. The scientists then take these wildfire emission samples to their gas chromatography lab. So it profiles all the different gases, different hydrocarbons in the sample, as well as CO and CO2. Over 99% of the carbon emitted will be as CO2. And that goes down as you get a much less efficient fire when you have a lot of smoldering, that's the kind of situation that causes a lot more pollution and air quality issues. Most typical forest fires are kind of a mix of the two. The results of our studies, we basically come up with what we call emission factors, and those are numbers that can be used by air quality agencies to estimate pollution. As wildfires grow in intensity and frequency, the effects of smoke are being felt by more people. Air quality is a hazard, but what science teaches us is that fire can actually be good for the ecosystem. In most of North America, uh, we have what we call fire-dependent ecosystems. The vegetation and the wildlife and pretty much all of the ecosystem components depend to, in different ways on different kinds of fire. 
And so there has been some research, especially in the Pacific Northwest, working with some of the tribal communities, that the smoke cools the air down and it creates a little bit more of that shading for the streams and the small rivers. That's a benefit for species like salmon. So every component of fire from, you know, the actual act of it, you know, <laughs> going through and burning woody debris to then the smoke that it creates and then the benefits after that fire are just so numerous. Ironically, many of these scientific conclusions are actually catching up to ancient practices. We cannot talk about wildfires in America without talking about Native American cultural burning. This is biologist Sarah Hoagland. She's a tribal liaison officer for the Missoula Fire Lab. Her research focuses on a threatened species of owls. In 1910, around western Montana, we had what was known as the Big Burn. After that, um, the Forest Service and the agency decided to go towards more fire suppression, portraying fire as sort of an enemy and that we need to just get rid of it and extinguish it. The Forest Service enacted what's known as the 10 a.m. rule. Every fire should be suppressed by 10 a.m. following its report. Our fire suppression policies that we've enacted over the last hundred years, it's created extremely dense forests. We now are experiencing more severe, more frequent, higher intensity fires in our forests because those fuels have built up for so long. A combo of these fire suppression tactics and drought conditions due to climate change are part of the reason why wildfires are getting worse. On top of Forest Service policies, their PR campaign around fire suppression focused on how fires were threatening adorable creatures. There are so many cartoons that show fire as an enemy. <laughs> change the, you know, PSA only, you can prevent forest fires, how would you change it? Oh, man. We need fire. Many species actually depend on fire. Enter the Mexican spotted owl. Woo! Sarah's been following this adorable creature for many years. I study the Mexican spotted owl in south central New Mexico with the Mescalero Apache tribe. It's threatened because of high severity stand replacing fire that impacts its habitat. The tribe that I get to work with, they are very active with their forest management. And so they do a lot of thinning and prescribed burns around their owl sites. And so some of the things that we've found with our research is that moderate level of thinning has reduced the risk of fire, but also maintained the habitat for the species. And so the tribe has really been able to figure out that balance for their forest. We know wildfires are getting worse, but the good news is that we know why, and we know how to fix it. You know, if you look at this and the other research we're conducting here, I'm very optimistic. I don't think all of our problems are gonna go away, but I think science is gonna provide us at least some good directions to go. Scientific knowledge and practical knowledge is already uh, well-developed that would allow us to vastly improve our ability to manage fire. The challenge is, of course, in the way our culture uh, utilizes that or doesn't utilize that information. That um, I have less confidence in, but certainly I know very well that our science and our, um, and our, our knowledge um, is sufficient to do a better job should we, should we as a society decide to do that. Taking something like fire out of the forest is like taking water out of the forest. It's something that the forest needs and it relies upon. There are so many other experiments going on at the Missoula Fire Lab that we don't have time for. This team studies LIDAR mapping to see how forest fires travel. This team conducts experiments on how rifle bullets ignite fire. In the future, scientists hope to predict where wildfires spread and how, and save our forests along the way. <laughs> Wow, I don't know if I've hugged the tree in a while. But for now, we will leave the scientists behind to play with fire. And that's our Wired Field Trip. See you next time. <laughs>